Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 229, Buzzard and Hurtado on God and Jesus, Part 2. In this episode of the Trinity's Podcast, we'll hear the rest of the dialogue between Sir Anthony Buzzard and Dr. Larry Hurtado. In the back and forth, it's now Dr. Hurtado's turn. I think I'd have to say that your, um, your understanding of what uh, Paul may or may not have meant by referring to Jesus' pre-existence is much more confident uh, than mine, and much more specific than I think I can determine from the text. So um, I'll have to remain un- unpersuaded at this point by your confident uh, claim of... If I may throw in one statement here, that I, and I entirely take your point. F.F. F. Bruce was kind enough to write private letters to me way back, and F.F. F. Bruce said, for what is worth, that the issue of pre-existence, is it the word who or which? Actually, it says it's the word which, question mark who. Then he went on to say that he, F.F. F. Bruce, was not in any way persuaded that Paul believed in a pre-existing son. Now, he thought on balance, John did. And so that discussion is for another day. I quite agree with you, and I fully take your point. My work has focused very much, particularly from the One God, One Lord book, on the earliest evidence that we have. I take the synoptic gospels to have been written in the latter decades of the first century and to be written for the churches that they addressed And although they draw upon early Jesus tradition, it seems to me that a comparison of them shows that each of these authors exercised impressive authorial freedom in um, giving his own rendition, so to speak, of Jesus' ministry. I don't know that we can read the Synoptic Gospels, first of all, as simply what Jesus said, because the Gospels don't all say the same thing. They are versions or interpretations of Jesus' tradition written late in the first century, in my view. And the earliest evidence that we have from the letters of Paul, uh, which I've emphasized, in those letters already Paul refers to something that we call pre-existence, as in Philippians 2. Uh, He does not say which. He says that Jesus was en morphe theou and then became a man. With most commentators, I understand that to be an allusion to the notion that in some form Jesus transmuted from being uh, this heavenly pre-existent entity to being the man. But uh, already also in Paul's letters, more importantly to my view, the complicating thing, which you say we don't want to complicate things, but the complicating thing for Christians all through the first several centuries was precisely the practice of worship. Indeed, for some of the church fathers, including even Athanasius, the question was, how can we say that Jesus and God are two different things and then worship Jesus as we do? And it's not at all the same thing as bowing down and reverencing an oriental king like Bathsheba is reported as doing. It's not the same thing at all. And from 1988 onward, I have been entirely specific in itemizing the several specific devotional actions that characterize and distinguish early Christian devotional practice. So let's not haggle over the semantics of the word worship. Let's look at the actual phenomena, which I've documented for nearly 30 years now. And uh, we have nothing like it in other texts. That pattern of devotional practice already presupposed in Paul's letters within the first 20 years As Martin Hengel said, more happened in Christology in those early 20 years than in the next eight centuries of Christian thought. And I agree with that. That's the crucial development. And that complicated things for people to say, then what the devil are we to do with that? They are distinct. And earliest, even the Nicene Creed, you know, when it calls Jesus God, notice what it says. God from God, light from light true God from true God. So again, his own divinity is always, even if it's described in the most exalted terms, is always described with reference to God the Father. And the reason for the complication, it seems to me, is this problem of a profession of one God and a devotional pattern that seems to complicate that by its dyadic shape. Just a number of quick observations. Dr. Hurtado is surely correct that most scholars now who are interpreting Philippians 2 think that it attributes some kind of pre-existence to Jesus. There is, of course, a minority report which doesn't see it as involving or implying pre-existence. That's the one that I think is correct. 
I give my reasons for reading it in this way back in Trinity's podcast number 49. But notice that Dr. Hurtado has to talk strangely here. He says that on this reading, Jesus is an entity which becomes a man. And the interesting thing I would point out is that there is no pre-existing category to put the pre-human Jesus into. It's just wrong. It's an anachronism to say that Paul thinks that Jesus was an eternal divine person. That's not part of his thought world. And the thought of the New Testament seems like you don't want to say that the pre-human Jesus is a God, and then this God becomes a man as well. That just doesn't seem to be taught there. What else could he possibly be? An angel? That doesn't seem right. He's not taught to be an angel. So there's no obvious category to put the pre-human Jesus into. And that may be something we should take as a warning signal that maybe we haven't got Paul right. I'm not saying it's more than a warning signal, but I think it's a point worth considering. Another point is why focus on a fourth century person like Athanasius? What about Origen or Justin Martyr, for instance? Are they so disturbed by the worship of Jesus that they think maybe Jesus is the same being as God, or maybe he's a divine person within God? I mean, do they really take any steps towards incorporating Jesus somehow within God? I suggest that they do not. Justin and Origen, whose views are pretty well known at this point, they both think Jesus can be worshipped. They don't worship him predicated on the assumption that he's the one God himself. They think he's a second and a lesser God, but they still think he's divine in a sense and worthy of worship. And this doesn't particularly bother them. It surely did bother some. This may be why the Patroposians collapsed the Father and Son into one being, so that then they wouldn't be worshipping more than one being. Hard to say. Now, really, did more happen in the first 20 years than in the next eight centuries as regards Christology? As somebody who's put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into reading through these debates and these councils that had to do with figuring out the logos and the man Jesus, the idea of a divine nature and a human nature and the composite Christ and all of this stuff. As someone who's read Tim Paul's excellent book on the subject, I just, someone like Hengel who says that maybe just doesn't care about this portion of the history of Christian theology. Because it's certainly not true that all the interesting action is happening right in the New Testament. At least not so far as I can tell. I see lots of new ideas coming in. Lots of new arguments. New theories. One last point quickly. I think Dr. Hurtado is absolutely correct in talking about this twofold devotional pattern that we see in the New Testament. But I think a question that he's a little bit less than clear on is, yeah, but did they think this was a theological problem? Did it, for them, entail a different view of God? Did it require a shift to the view that God is multipersonal, rather than a single, mighty, wonderful, lovable self? According to the justification that Dr. Hurtado himself has discovered in the New Testament, And that justification is that they worshipped Jesus because God willed it. If that was their reason, then the worship of Jesus wouldn't really, for them, suggest any change in their core theology, right? When the Trinity's podcast returns, Q&A time. Dr. Hurtado, 
Romans 10, 13, when it talks about those who call upon the name of the Lord, basically, is that Lord of Romans 10, 13? Should we understand that as to be Yahweh, as Joel 2, 32 does, or should we understand that to simply mean Master Jesus? Okay, thanks. That's a really good, important text. Um, Yeah, I think we have to, particularly if you look at the larger context of earlier uh, verses in Romans 10, Romans 10, 13 becomes a kind of climax a climactic statement. Earlier in the passage, it talks about if you uh, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and, and confess Jesus is Lord, uh, Kyrios, you shall be saved. And then it winds up in 1013 with, and whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in the context, it seems to me that the Lord who has been talked about all through in the previous verses is Jesus. Now, here's again another example of that complicating factor which generated all this discussion that goes, helps to generate all that discussion that goes on in the next several centuries. On the one hand, Paul characteristically refers to Jesus as Hokurios, and in the preceding context, as I say, it seems to me that that's who he's referring to. On the other hand, what he does is to use a biblical text, which he cited from Joel, which in its earlier context, to call upon the name of Yahweh is the, is the Hebrew there, Uh, But Paul takes that biblical text and applies it to the cultic invocation of Jesus, the cultic confession of Jesus, which he's described just earlier in the passage. So there's the complication. On the one hand, it's pretty clear he's applying this cultic action to Jesus, not to God the Father. On the other hand, he uses the language derived from the Bible for prayer and worship of Yahweh to describe it. So you see what I mean? It's a complicating thing. It's a messy kind of thing in that sense. What the devil is he actually doing? And elsewhere, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for example, Paul can refer to believers as all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there you have the fuller version of it. So for him, this kind of uh, cultic invocation of Jesus, which I take it probably functioned in order to constitute the worship assembly, the Maranatha kind of thing that we have in Aramaic, the equivalent in which Jesus is invoked as the Kyrios, which constitutes the worship gathering in his name. This is what you do to invoke a god in the Roman world. It's the action that is involved in invoking a a deity to constitute a cultic worship. And yet, the figure they're invoking is not God the Father, it's his son, Jesus, but they're treating him in a way, in a cultic action, that is how you would ordinarily in the Roman world treat a god. So you see what I mean? Which is it? What's going on? It doesn't fit any of the neat little categories of either Jewish, so-called Jewish monotheism, or of pagan polytheism. It's something novel. That's what I meant in 1988 in saying it appears to be a novel mutation. This, of course, is an important question. I would simply say this, that all the second coming texts in the Old Testament are Yahweh texts. They're applied to Jesus. The biblical Unitarian doesn't argue with that for one moment. Yahweh texts are applied to Jesus. It doesn't make him Yahweh. Here's my point about Psalm 110.1, because I'm trying to force this back into into discussion. All the exaltation texts, Philippians 2, for example, Jesus is superbly and supremely exalted to the glory of God the Father. That's 1,300 times in New Testament. You've heard that God equals the Father. Yes, a couple of times the word God is applied to Jesus. We know that. So the worship of Jesus means absolutely nothing unless you define what you mean by Jesus. Who is he? The exaltation of Jesus is absolutely clear. It's unprecedented. It's a brand new thing. It's not just the worship of an angel or any secondary figure. It's the worship of Messiah. But it doesn't make him infringe upon the unitary monotheism of Jesus. That's the key. And the unitary monotheism of Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, where he says, to us as one God the Father, no other God except him. That is pure Shema. So we've got to settle on deciding what the Shema means. If we don't do that, we have no basis to argue from. Having said that, then, every time you get an exaltation text, let's take Acts 2, that God has made him Lord and Messiah, not made him God, of course not. All of that is Psalm 110.1. Every time you come to an exaltation text, including Philippians 2, you're supposed to know about Psalm 110.1. And if you misquote the second Lord as Adonai, you obviously have not really looked at the Hebrew here. That's critical. Every exaltation text is to signal the fact that we're talking about Psalm 1, where only one person is Yahweh, the other is not Yahweh. 195 times, how much more do we need? 
It's deity speaking to non-deity, however highly and uniquely elevated. Well, granted, in the original setting, obviously, if, if you want to look at the original setting of Psalm 110, it is commonly taken as a poem celebrating God's enthronement of an earthly Davidic king. So it is not, not only not, not a transcendent figure of any kind, it is an earthly human king. But the question is, when early Christians read that text, did they take it as simply God enthroning a human king, in this case, Jesus as another human king, or did they read it as a much more powerful or unique kind of exaltation? And it seems to me that they did, as is evidenced by the way in which, as I say, they can almost elide the figure of Yahweh and Jesus in the way in which they appropriate Old Testament texts and do so to describe actions that pertain in the Old Testament to Yahweh alone, such as calling upon his name. You do not have that kind of action used for any other figure in the Old Testament, in the same way, legitimately, the early Christians appropriate this language and this cultic action to include or enfold Jesus within it. Now, again, they do so because they believe that God requires it. That is, God, if the lines are now blurred in some kind of way between what to think of Jesus, it is God who has done the blurring in their point of view. And it introduces, granted, a certain complexity. But Jesus is, for the early Christians, not simply Messiah in the sense of, Psal of Psalms of Solomon 17 and 18, because that figure is not pictured as receiving the kind of cultic devotion that we have in the New Testament. You do not baptize in his name. You do not invoke that figure to constitute a synagogue meeting and so on. But you do do all those things to the figure of Jesus. So it's not easy to categorize. With respect, I can appreciate the difficulty and the frustration. And I agree that some of the language and the rhetoric, particularly, it seems to me, in the fourth century and thereafter, and I think largely generated in reaction against Arianism, there was a tendency to kind of overcompensate, it seems to me, and to up the rhetoric. You know, Jesus is God, full stop, without retaining the differentiation between God the Father and Jesus that we have everywhere in the New Testament. This is what I was trying to say in talking about, in earlier work, a binitarian pattern. More recently, I've used the word dyadic and explain what I mean is two figures who are distinguished from each other and uniquely and inextricably linked with each other. Certainly, two figures linked to each other, but the language has to be made clearer. Certainly linked to each other. Certainly, Jesus is the recipient of Yahweh texts, as an agent. Jesus is the agent of God, not God himself. There's no need to take that extra step and then banish people from the church if they're not prepared to say Jesus is Yahweh. This is the level of, of miseducation, I think, to which we've alive. Why not just agree to say what you have said, that Jesus is a supreme, however elevated you want to put him, unique agent of the one God, but not to the infringement of the Shema, which horrifies both the Muslims and the Jews, and I think infringes the Sola Scriptura, a diadea. Maybe one doesn't believe in that. Once you say that you believe in the Bible only, I think one is in great danger of saying, actually, I don't, because those creeds have taught me that there's no difference at all between God and Jesus. In fact, I must say, if I believe the creeds, that Jesus is man and not a man. I must say, he are three, this is Millard Erickson, I must be a good Trinitarian and say, he are three and they is one. I'm lost there. I don't think the public needs that sort of nonsense. And if they would simply differentiate between what the creeds eventually went to, and you made that point well just now, it was Jesus is God and that's it. Jesus is Yahweh. James Dunn and McGrath, and I think yourself really, are most of the way in conceding that that's not necessary. Elevate Jesus uniquely, but don't forget the Psalm 110.1, which is applied by Jesus to himself and by the rest of the New Testament. That's standing guard over any tendencies to go beyond and make Jesus essentially man and not a man. In the text that you keep citing from the Gospels, notice that when Jesus is pictured as citing the text, yes. it says, how do the scribes call Messiah David's son? Yes. David calls him my Lord. Yes. The implication is that whatever the figure is there, as interpreted in the New Testament, it is superior to any previous notion of Messiah, yes. superior to David, 
somebody who is so exalted that even the great noble King David of biblical tradition refers to him prophetically as my Lord. Thirdly so, agreed. I don't want to be difficult. I get, I'm sorry, I feel like I am being difficult, but I don't want to be difficult. But it seems to me that there is inherent in the material that we have already in the New Testament a certain complexity that is novel and is without precedent and for which there weren't pre-existent categories to accommodate them. Early Christians were having to sort of hammer out a new view of how to talk about God and a new way of worshiping God that was in some sense without full precedent. In the process, you know, it didn't come down all at once. They had to hammer it out over time. We see certain developments even across the literature that we have in the New Testament. And that complexity, that difficulty of holding together one God and Jesus is what I think generates the discussion that goes on for several centuries, as I said before. And whatever one thinks of that discussion, they weren't trying to be perverse. They were dealing with a genuine complexity that's there. And I hear you wanting to be, forgive me, but it seems to me perhaps wanting to be a bit more simple or simplified than it seems to me that the data warrant. That's all. Yeah, no, you're right. I do want to be simple. I think that the text gives us simplicity. I don't think that all the complexity, I mean, again, Jesus is man, but not a man. The Trinity is indivisible in its divisions. I think we went into sort of madhouse language there. That's why people don't preach on this in the local churches. They don't know what this is. All they know is that they are to believe in that triune God. They are to say Jesus is flat out God on pain of being excommunicated. I'm against that. I don't think any of that is necessary. If we had stuck with the Shema, and of course I'm differing with you on the authority of the synoptics a little bit, I think Jesus had that conversation with the Jew. And in that conversation, Jesus was a unitary, non-Trinitarian, non-Aryan monotheist. If that's not true, I think then the scriptures have no validity. There's no reference to a human king there. One can imagine that. Jesus himself applies that to himself. And as for saying he didn't think he was a Messiah, I thought that Peter asked him, or replied to him, and Jesus said, who do you say I am? Messiah. Jesus is ecstatic. And you're telling me he's not sure he's Messiah? That doesn't work on those texts, I think. Obviously, if he's not the Messiah, Luke got that totally wrong from the beginning. Matthew did. The whole thing is scrapped if Jesus is not the Messiah. Wow, okay. That was a really interesting exchange. And it does bring out some differences between Sir Anthony Buzzard and Dr. Larry Hurtado. One difference is that Dr. Hurtado, and I've never quite understood this about him, but he's reticent to be drawn into theological discussions. He wants to stick to history, and yet at the same time, it's clear that he's interested in it partly for theological reasons. What they agree on is that the New Testament does not collapse the distinction between Jesus and his God. They agree that Jesus and God are numerically two. What they're disagreeing on is Christology, obviously, and Sir Anthony Buzzard is pretty clear about his position. It's what people today call biblical Unitarian, or sometimes not too properly, they describe it as Socinian. It's the view that Jesus is a man who began to exist when he was miraculously conceived in his mother, Mary, and so he didn't exist before his human life, but he is a real man doesn't have a divine nature or anything like that, didn't help to create the world, but is everything that the New Testament really says the Messiah is. Since he's been raised and exalted, he's the boss of the universe under God, basically. Dr. Hurtado, again, he's reticent to commit himself, but some of his statements here make me think that he's assuming that it's obvious that, if I could use the ancient derogatory term, he thinks it's obvious that a mere man Christology is just wrong. It doesn't fit the New Testament at all. The thing that's interesting here is that the reason that he has given why the earliest Christians worshipped Jesus, which is that God wills it, that is perfectly consistent with a, quote, mere man view about Jesus. And so why is a mere man view wrong? What's wrong about it? Why doesn't it fit? Well, we already saw from before that he thinks that Philippians 2 teaches a pre-human existence for Jesus. I'm just guessing he probably thinks the same about John 1 and a few other texts. But the thing that really interests him is the topic of worship. 
And over and over, he points out that there's a complexity in the pattern of worship that's in the New Testament. Yeah, that's true. And it is remarkable and unique and interesting. But again, it's not clear that it entails any complexity in God. You have to distinguish complexity of Christian practice from complexity in God, as in there are many persons within the one God. I really liked their discussion just now about Yahweh texts from the Old Testament that are applied to Jesus as their fulfillment in the New Testament. And it seemed to me that both of our scholars here avoid what I call a fulfillment fallacy, which is thinking that the original text was about a certain one, and then Jesus in the New Testament is said to be a fulfillment of that text. And so therefore, Jesus is the original one that was talked about. That is clearly a fallacy. It's kind of a beginner's mistake in reading the New Testament, really. Emmanuel was a baby in the time of Isaiah. If Jesus fulfills that prophecy, the author can only mean that it's like a second fulfillment. He's not trying to say that this same baby is now Jesus. A great number of Yahweh texts, as they discussed, are applied to Jesus, but that's not the author's way of saying that Jesus is Yahweh. Now, I did notice that Dr. Hurtado said this. Did they take it as simply God enthroning a human king, in this case, Jesus as another human king, or did they read it as a much more powerful or unique kind of exaltation? And it seems to me that they did, as is evidenced by the way in which, as I say, they can almost elide the figure of Yahweh and Jesus in the way in which they appropriate Old Testament texts and do so to describe actions that pertain in the Old Testament to Yahweh alone, such as calling upon his name. Almost elide. To elide here would be to ignore the differences between the two. To almost ignore the differences is just to not ignore the differences, right? And they just don't. And this term figure, it's, it's a strange term. I think when it's taken out of just talking about literary characters, you know, the figure of Sherlock Holmes or something like that. As Sir Anthony pointed out, the New Testament doesn't present the father and the son as two closely associated figures. It presents the Father as the one true God and the Son as a human being, a real man who is the unique Messiah, the anointed one of that one true God. And this takes us back to the theme of confusion. I think Dr. Hurtado, and this is reading between the lines, I think he's assuming a narrative of confusion, that something about Jesus threw them into a theological conundrum and they weren't quite sure what to think. And thank goodness this was worked out over a long course of careful thinking. I guess I'm just on buzzard's side here. I don't see any confusion there. They just have the father and son being two different beings, and the first one being the God of the second one throughout, even though they're applying these Yahweh texts to the son. They're either saying that Yahweh is fulfilling these through the son, like he's coming to his people in the person of the son, Or they're just saying that it's a second layer of meaning that they are discovering in those texts. As we'll hear Dr. Hurtado say a little bit later in this conversation. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Anthony Buzzard wants to fact check an interesting quotation from Dr. Hurtado. My Archbishop of Canterbury is saying Jesus didn't think he was deity. James Dunn says the same thing. I think that's correct. So I would ask you, you are alleged to have said at one meeting, and I, I would love to get the record straight here because it's being put about that you said in answer to the question, did Jesus think he was God? You are alleged to have said, hell no. 
<laughs> which I think is extremely funny, but just for the record, would you would you clarify that? Did you, in fact, get that question? Did you say, hell no, of course not? Sorry. Uh, to me, well, I've said that after a glass or two of single malt. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I do come from a truck driver's family, and they are plain spoken. No, I quite agree that Jesus did not claim that he was God and did not uh, imagine himself to be a second person of the Trinity and did not insist that he should be worshipped. The question is, what has God said about him? The primary basis for all of the Christological claims in the New Testament is not simply what Jesus demanded himself or what Jesus imagined about himself. But in the, uh, in the language of the New Testament, the basis for Christological claims is their conviction about what God has said about him and what God has done. And their claim is that God has validated him as Messiah, as Kyrios, has exalted him to uh, superlative heavenly glory, the language in Philippians super exalted him, and given him the name above every name, so that their claim is this is what God has done. And so by George, you'd better answer accordingly and better act accordingly and think accordingly, or you are disobeying God in their view. Again, it seems to me that you may want to be privileging something that Jesus is quoted as saying in the Gospels or something that Jesus would have thought of himself before God has exalted him or before God has declared him to be Lord. It would be totally inappropriate for him to claim that he was. It would be maniacal. But once God has made him Lord and exalted him and given him heavenly glory, then it is inappropriate to say anything but what God has said about him. Sorry, but I have to jump in here again. That was well said. I completely agree. I would just add the point that if Jesus's, quote, deity or, quote, divine status is due to divine action, if it's because of something that God has freely done with respect to him, then it's not a matter of essence. But Trinitarian traditions insist that what is different about Jesus is that he has a divine nature. It's all a matter of essence, and really nothing special about him depends on divine action. Even his worship worthiness specifically, they think, depends on his having a divine essence. Okay, but there's another question. We have a question here um, for both of you. So you can go first, Dr. Taro. Uh, do you think the uh, pre-Nicene uh, church fathers were Trinitarians? If not, what was their theology? Pre-Nicene. Well, some Pre were probably tending in that direction, some weren't. The earliest figure who refers to uh, Trinity using that term, as I recall, is Tertullian from the early 3rd century. So you have figures who are beginning to use that kind of language just a bit, but there are others who weren't Trinitarian, at least in the way in which Nicaea articulated it. The most famous, of course, is the so in the so-called Arian controversy of the late third century, in which Arians were accused, whether they were or not, we hardly know for well, but Arians were accused of distinguishing between the being or essence of God and the being and essence of the Son, saying that he is a God, but not God in the same way that God the Father is God, a different essence. They seem to be using, again, those Platonic categories of a high God, a middle God, a lower God. So godness is kind of gradation into terms. That was their way of trying to cope with it. Ultimately, that was seen to be unsatisfactory because, ironically, for uh, Sir Anthony's case, part of the reason that Nicaea rejected that Arian thing was because they said, but that is to multiply gods. You wind up with two gods then. Because you say that God the Father is God, and you say that Jesus is God, but a different kind of God, but that's to engage in polytheism. We're not polytheists, we're monotheists. So their way of trying to be monotheists was precisely to do this kind of Trinitarian thing. Now, as I say, I don't think that we should be bound by fourth century formulations. I think we should respect them. I think we should try to understand what they were up to and try to get inside what they were doing, the issues they were wrestling with but they were working with philosophical categories of a Platonic nature of that time. We don't anymore. As I've argued in the book, one, uh, in the little book, uh, God in New Testament Theology, I there argued that theologians should, so to speak, bypass the Cappadocian fathers and perhaps even bypass Nicaea and go back to the New Testament text and consider what kind of um, theological discourse would be appropriate for us to develop today primarily drawing upon the uh, shape of the discourse and religious practice that we have in the New Testament. 
we're very much in agreement. There's obviously a, a difference on the nature of pre-existence. But absolutely, I find some of the language of the councils incomprehensible for myself and certainly for those who ascribe to the Trinity in the churches. I'm living in the South here, where again, I repeat, and if you're not prepared to say Jesus is Yahweh flat out, you aren't valid. I'm against that. That's not fair. It's like trying to rescue a Jehovah's Witness from the tyranny of the watchtower. I want to rescue people from that sort of language. And you're saying the same thing. We'll go out immediately and look at your little book on how you talked about the uh, Greek fathers. That would be most interesting. Thank you. We have uh, Dr. Taro Keegan Chandler. He's the author of uh, The God of Jesus in Light of uh, Christian Doctrine. Uh, this is a, a work we published recently. Hey, uh, Dr. Hurtado, uh, mm. thank you so much for uh, joining us and, and speaking with us. I've really enjoyed this discussion so far. My big question was uh, going to be if Jesus thought he was God. So uh, I was very happy to hear your, your answer on that. And I think um, you, I was, for the most part, is very satisfied with that, uh, with that answer. I would, I would point out uh, something that you said. If Jesus were not exalted, it would have been a maniacal for him to expect worship as Yahweh. I would say you know, that would kind of contravene with most people's understanding of, say, the deity of Christ or the doctrine of the Trinity, which is, contends that while Jesus was human, he remained fully God. So he would have absolutely had the right to be worshiped as Yahweh and would have had the right to ask for that too, if he in his inner nature remained 100% Yahweh while he was fully man. So that was one point. But I really wanted to make a comment back to um, something that one of our guests said earlier in regard to application of Old Testament Yahweh text onto the Lord Jesus. I think you are absolutely right to say that, to recommend that we bypass the Cappadocian fathers and even Nicaea and look back into the scriptures themselves. And then also, very importantly, to the world which produced them. I think the uh, discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls has perhaps helped us identify some of the exegetical habits of the New Testament community. It's helped us to identify them within their first century Jewish context. So, uh, you know, Longnecker and others have identified at least four different ways in which Old Testament passages are exegeted in the New. So, for example, we have the uh, Midrashic or a Pesher interpretation of the Old Testament, which operates in the world of reapplication or in applying additional new meanings to Old Testament passages while preserving the original meaning. So, uh, we, we have this uh, in the New Testament. So, in uh, Matthew's treatment of Hosea 11.1, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Obviously about Israel and the Exodus. And now in the New Testament, it's also about Jesus. So there's a new reapplication and an additional meaning brought alongside that that does not necessarily contravene with the original. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, of course, we have the Qumran community taking passages from Isaiah, proclaiming the favorable year of Yahweh, and they substitute Melchizedek's name in that. Now we have the favorable year of Melchizedek. I mean, that's, that's some pretty, uh, it's pretty interesting uh, exegesis there where we're going to substitute uh, Melchizedek, whether you think he was a human priest or an angel or some kind of intermediary figure. Uh, it's pretty interesting. One other point, uh, in Acts 13, we actually find Paul and Barnabas taking the suffering servant passages, which are originally about the Messiah in Isaiah, and then they say, God has told us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring. So does that mean that Paul and Barnabas are the Messiah? No, but they participate in that same messianic mission. And so that can be spiritually reapplied to them without abrogating the original meaning. And so I would suggest that since this is an established pattern of exegeting Old Testament passages in the New, we might want to consider some of these Yahweh passages being applied to Jesus in the same way. By doing this, we're not begging for Jesus to be identified as Yahweh or anything like that, but simply he participates in the same mission or function or anything. So these things can be applied to him, particularly with Romans 10, 13. We have them very uh, cleverly playing off of the ambiguous curios there with the Lord and then obviously um, the, the Lord and the Septuagint. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to point that out and see if you had any, any comments on that. And thank you so much for your time today, doctor. I appreciate it. Thank you. No, I agree that the uh, the application of texts that originally referred to God 
applying them to other figures is not unique in the New Testament. I mean, another Qumran text, of course, famous text about Melchizedek is Psalm 82, you know, God shall arise in the assembly of the gods. And the text uh, says this is Melchizedek, who is identified as the god who, who emerges as head of the council of the gods there in Psalm 82. So the application of texts to a subsequent figure is not unique to the New Testament, and they are, in some sense, probably reflecting what David Alney perhaps has called charismatic interpretation of biblical texts that you have in uh, reflected in some of these uh, Qumran texts. Yes, I agree that when they apply an Old Testament text to Jesus, they do not intend to negate its application to God as well. I tried to refer earlier from 1988 book onward to Jesus being enfranchised within the discourse about God and being enfranchised within the devotional pattern that is given to God so that he becomes essential thereafter for discourse about God and for adequate worship of God. But it's not at God's expense. He, God, as they say, shares the name, the glory, the throne with him, and he is uh, both distinguished from God, but also enfranchised within him in very vivid ways, including sitting, sitting right on the throne with God. But the other point I want to make is that what is distinctive again, it seems to me, and it's a historical claim free for someone else to falsify, but I'm waiting some 35 years for it to be done. What this seems to be distinctive is not so much the rhetoric, including even the rhetoric of applying Old Testament text to God, to Jesus, but the devotional practice in which Jesus is treated as so programmatic to the worship of God that a failure to invoke him, a failure to incorporate him into the worship pattern is an inadequate form of worship in their view. That is the unique development. Yes, that's an excellent point for what is worth. Biblical Unitarians, Sassinians, the Monarchians early on would not disagree with that one bit. You cannot be worshiping God without worshiping Jesus. They are inextricably linked. What I don't think is true is that as identity, it is false, I would suggest, to say that Jesus is Yahweh. He isn't Yahweh. Yahweh is the Father. Is he doing the things of Yahweh as a supreme agent? Of course, he's the agent. But to blur the distinction saying he is, in fact, Yahweh himself, thus leading us all to, to this extraordinary language, difficult, complex language, I don't think we need that. What's wrong with the New Testament as it stands? When the Trinity's podcast returns, the moderator or host, Carlos Jimenez, presses this issue of the deity of Christ. Dr. Dunn, uh, James Dunn, we've, has been cited a lot in his book, Did the First Christians Worship Jesus? As you know, that little book. He says this. Uh, do you agree with this statement or is this going beyond or Jesus yeah. is not the God of Israel? He is not Yahweh? Yes, if you put it in those kind of simple terms, I would have to say I don't know that anybody can disagree with that. Good. Oh. Um, okay. Uh, and as I say, it seems to me that the as I understand it, I'm not a specialist in patristics, but as I understand, even the consular uh, creeds of the Constantinopolitan Nicene Creed aren't saying that. They're saying that he is a person of the Trinity. He is not God tout simple. So even, <laughs> yes, I agree that to force people even to try to cope with the Nicene Constantinopolitan categories is uh, uh, an unhelpful complexity for us today, largely because we don't live in that intellectual world anymore, and we weren't facing those issues. But I would say that uh, if that's the question, is Jesus simply the God of Israel, so that everywhere you see God simply overwrite it with Jesus, that would be to go against what I think all of the New Testament authors are trying to say. So as I say, there's a dyadic worship pattern, and a triadic discourse pattern in which you have reference to God the Father, to Jesus as his exalted Son, and to the Spirit as an agent who takes on, in some sense, the identity of the one or the other, which is an interesting phenomenon. He can be described as the Spirit of God, but also as the Spirit of Christ. And I take that to be the same entity, sort of given a dual 
dual identity, so to speak, which again is very unusual, uh, very remarkable. I can't think of any other exalted figure or angel by whom uh, the divine spirit is identified in quite the same way. So is Jesus Yahweh pure and simple? No. Is Jesus enfranchised within the kind of uh, language that is used for Yahweh and the kind of cultic action that is otherwise reserved for Yahweh? Yes. Our final point, uh, language one for me, our Lord Jesus Christ, and occasionally my Lord Jesus Christ, this is absolutely not Yahweh language. We know it's a language monstrosity to talk about our Yahweh. I've got to break in here quickly. I'm not sure why Sir Anthony Buzzard thinks it's a language monstrosity to use the phrase our Yahweh. After all, we do talk about my and our, and then fill in the phrase with a proper name. His wife might refer to my Anthony. His children might refer to our Anthony. And this is just something we do. I mean, God is our God. I don't see then anything ungrammatical or in any way untoward about saying our Yahweh. So when we get to 1 Corinthians 8, to say that he's talking about one God, the Father, the Shema, obviously repeated, and then the Lord Jesus Christ is one. But Paul has been talking about our Lord Jesus constantly in those letters, and what, 100 or 200 times in all of his letters. That, I think, is self-evident. That distinction should not be blurred. Our Lord Jesus is not our Yahweh Jesus. Luke was right in citing the Psalms of Solomon and calling Jesus the Messiah Lord. Let's not blur the two lords. They're quite distinct. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritaro. Thanks, everyone else. Sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. Do you have any last words you want to? No, I think uh, it's been a great privilege to be able to chat. And uh, sorry we couldn't get to all the, what does it look like, 35 people who have questions there, according to my screen. I'm sorry about that. Yes, it's uh, very it, just, it just shows how, obviously, uh, how interested, uh, how interesting the topic is for a great many people. So um, I hope uh, this, this probably won't be the last time for any of us to engage these questions. Thank you so much. All righty. Do, do you have any last word? It's a good way to introduce the subject. I think the issues are clearer. When we're talking about worship, we are agreeing fully that Jesus is worshipped. The issue is, is he worshipped as Yahweh himself? Or is he worshipped as Messiah? Why not both? Why not allow God to do something quite unprecedented with Messiah, the man Messiah, without blurring the difference between man and God? That's the danger. Well said. Well, that was an interesting discussion, wasn't it? And as I said before, it's pretty clear to me that Dr. Hurtado and Sir Anthony Buzzard are agreeing that in the New Testament, Jesus and God are not supposed to be numerically the same. Rather, they are supposed to be two beings. And that got me to wondering. Dr. Hurtado said at one point in this last exchange, how can anybody collapse the two, basically? Well, he's reading scholars if you read popular evangelical apologists, you'll find them very often collapsing Jesus and God and saying that Jesus is the God of Israel. That's what they understand by the phrase, the deity of Christ. Dr. Hurtado quite properly points out that if the one God is supposed to be the Trinity, the one God then can't just be identical to the Son. That makes no sense. The one God can't be identical to both of those things. But back to his views... This exchange got me to thinking about my podcast 124, which was addressed to these confused popular apologists. It was called A Challenge to Jesus as God Apologists. And when I'm looking at this argument, which I'll put on the blog post for this episode, it seems to me that Dr. Hurtado should just agree that this is a sound argument. If he doesn't agree, I'd be really curious to find out where he gets off the bus. So just to run through it really quickly... Premise one, Jesus and God differ. I'm pretty sure he would agree with that. Premise two, things which differ are two. That is not numerically identical. That's self-evident, so I think he's going to go along with that. And it follows that God and Jesus are two. That is not numerically identical. That's just what I said that he and Sir Anthony agree on. Premise four basically says that to be the same God requires being the same being. Well, but they're not the same being because they're numerically two, because they're different. 
So second conclusion of the argument is step five. Therefore, God and Jesus are not the same God, but there's only one God. So if they're not the same God and there's only one God, step seven, therefore, either God is not a God or Jesus is not a God. But step eight, of course, God is a God. That's just true by definition, right? And so then it follows from those last two steps, the final conclusion, step nine, therefore, Jesus is not a God. Does he agree that this is a sound argument? I think he has to agree that it's valid, so there's no mistake in the reasoning. But my question for him is, does he agree with premises one, two, four, six, and eight? If so, that's interesting. And maybe it would be relevant to some of those apologists who like to appeal to his work as supporting their understanding of, quote, the deity of Christ, the view that Jesus just is God and God just is Jesus, that they're numerically one. So I think he would agree that it's a sound argument. And yet one of his books, which I have on my shelf, is called How on Earth Did Jesus Become a God? Is that just a provocative title or is it meant literally? Is the New Testament view that Jesus is a God? Because if it is the New Testament view, then he'd either have to be the same God as the Father, or he'd have to be an additional God. And you can see why New Testament authors wouldn't go in either of those directions. Okay, but if he doesn't like the conclusion that Jesus is not a God, then where does the argument go wrong? Where's the false premise in steps one through eight? Thanks for listening. Thanks again to Dr. Hurtado for making himself available like this, and to Sir Anthony Buzzard and Carlos Jimenez for putting the whole thing on. Again, I've got links for Dr. Hurtado's blog and for his appearances on the Trinity's podcast, and also for other videos produced by the Restoration Fellowship. This week's thinking music has been the track We Are Now by Marco Trovatello. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind. <laughs>